Meet Chanel. She loves jogging and chocolate. She died when she was hacked to death with a machete. Now meet Ariane. She's four years old. She likes cake and milk. She died when she was stabbed in her eyes and in her head. These are just two of the one million victims of the Rwandan genocide in 1994, which wiped out almost 20% of Rwanda's population. Dr. Richard and his colleagues in 2002 started the Never Again Foundation, taking a stand and saying never again in Rwanda would this happen. Never again. This is Ms. Antoine Suchi. She's a Burmese opposition leader. When she won the elections in 1990, she was put under house arrest, where she remained for 15 years. Through despair, through depression, through sickness, through even the roof of her house falling in, she refused to turn her back on the Burmese people. She said never again would her people be denied their fundamental right to democracy. Never again. On a much smaller scale, inspired by people like Ms. Suchi and Dr. Richard in Rwanda, I too had cause to say, never again. When my sister, who was 12 years old at the time, became very sick in Nigeria, we searched for hours to try and find an air ambulance. There wasn't an aircraft available in the whole of West Africa, and we realized that the nearest aircraft that was capable of carrying my sister from that area where she'd overwhelmed the level of care available to her to a more suitable level of care was over six hours away in Johannesburg. My sister died before that ambulance landed in Lagos. And that made me say never again. Never again in Nigeria would a family have to go through this. But at the time I made that decision, I was a very, very shy, introverted medical student. We didn't have the funds or the business connections or the network that we needed to start an air ambulance service. Who was I even to utter the words never again? But today, we operate the largest air ambulance service in the whole of West Africa. Our pool of 20 aircrafts and 44 trained flight physicians save lives every single day. Every day, we have the opportunity and the privilege to say, never again. And I'd just like to tell you a bit about the challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day work. The number four. Nigeria ranks fourth in the world for its rate of kidnappings. Almost 10% of all the kidnappings in the world occur in Nigeria. The injuries that we see include stab wounds, gunshot wounds, and acid burns. And it is our job in the air ambulance to transfer these victims of these horrible crimes from areas where they've often been left for dead to areas of more appropriate medical care. Another number, two million. Two million people every single year suffer severe trauma or injury in Nigeria. And it's difficult, extremely difficult, because of the expanse of the country, to transfer these people by land, especially when 85% of our roads look like this. Or this, our air ambulance bridges that gap. 26, this is the number of students who were killed last week, either shot at point-blank range or stabbed and had their throats slit in a terrorist attack on a university campus just last week in northern Nigeria. Our rare ambulances were on standby to make sure that if any of these students had survivable injuries, then we could transfer them from the rural area where this atrocity occurred to more suitable medical care in our cities, nearly two hours away by air, impassable by road. Now, what does the world think of this? 
$22.9 billion in aid was given to Africa to tackle the problems of HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Nigeria received less than $1 million in funding for trauma. Now, I don't want to belittle the importance of the treatment of infectious disease, but I'm a trauma doctor, so I'm going to talk about trauma. Never again, this is why we have all said, never again will we leave Nigeria without a service that can circumvent the huge problem of trauma that we have. 90% of the world's trauma occurs in low to middle income countries just like Nigeria. The Tomorrow's Doctors document was a revolutionary document in doctors' training. It came out in 1993, and it encouraged us as physicians to stop looking at patients as labels or diseases and start looking at patients as fellow human beings with biological, social, and psychological elements to their illnesses. And it changed the way we think as doctors. It changed the way that medical students were trained. But it was probably designed by people who looked a bit like this, and dressed a bit like this, and spoke a bit like this, and worked in buildings like the one you see behind. You see, at that point in time, only people who were well-connected, who were privileged, who had the wealth, who had the pedigree, could incite real change. But thanks to our new digital friends, anybody with a laptop can now make real change. And if Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma and Dr. Richard in Rwanda could change a nation by simply saying never again, then that means one person can change an entire country. And if one person can change an entire country, then that means if everybody in this room were to say never again, we could change the world. So I'd like to launch my own revolutionary document, and it's called Tomorrow's Changemakers. Tomorrow's Changemakers will not just react to the causes of disaster, or to react to when disasters happen, like I do, but start looking at the things that cause them and look at preventing the disasters happening in the first place. So I'd like to use this opportunity to reach out to the introverted and to the shy and to the marginalized, and perhaps those round pegs that don't quite fit in those square holes, and to the people that maybe mumble and stammer when they speak. I'm reaching out not to the searchers for consensus, but the molders of consensus. Never before in history has there been such an opportunity for the little people like us to make such a big difference. This is our time. Welcome to the era of the underdog. Thank you.